Hi, this is Farhan Lalji from TSN in Vancouver. Nabil Kareem from ESPN in Connecticut. Nabil, you know, the last time you and I talked on cameras, it was uh, when you were still working for TSN and you were probably throwing to one of my stories or we were talking back and forth from a live event. And uh, great that we get a chance to do this again in this format. But uh, I want to ask you, just when did your interest in sports first begin? Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, I think it would go back to high school. And um, I would take it back to grade 10. And I know you, I've told you this story before, but uh, for people who don't know, you were, I think, just starting at TSN at that time. You'd gone from CBC to TSN, and I was in a business 10 class, and we had to bring in a speaker. And I, you were coaching at Burnaby Central at that time, football. I connected, uh, to, uh, connected with you, got you to come over, and you were one of the people that drove my passion to, to be in this industry. Now, after that, I was motivated to do it. But the thing was, I didn't see many people who look like you. You were one of the only people, I think, in sports, smiley wise, uh, smiley wise anyways, um, that was doing it. And I kind of lost that passion because I just thought it'd be too difficult. So I took another path. And it wasn't until later university that I, I really decided that I wanted to do this. But I think originally my path started uh, early in high school, or I should say late in high school. Uh, but what about you? Because... For me, it's really interesting. I don't really know much about your show. When did it start for you? Because you really were a trailblazer for us. Yeah, it made me feel like the OG, just so you know. We've had this you discussion. Are, <laughs> the fact that I went to your high school, that makes me feel old. But I'm, I'm good with it. If I could inspire you to do greatness, that's great for me. Um, honestly, like I loved sports growing up. I mean, I was the guy that not just played everything, but I was the guy that organized all of my friends to play everything. And whether those are my friends from – Jamaat Khanna, or those are my friends from elementary school at the time. I mean, I, I just had such a passion for sports. Um, my dad always thought it was a waste, you know, and Ismaili father, you immigrate here, you know, you, you want your son to do all the professional things, right? You want to be a lawyer or a doctor or, or something like that. And I remember one time, I still have the report card that, you know, I got a bunch of B's and some C pluses and one of my report cards uh, probably got an A in gym. And the teacher wrote in the comments that to my, to my parents that, you'll have to accept the fact that sports will always be first to him. And my dad was not happy with that at all. And, um, you know, he grew up as a guy that played a lot of sports as well. But when he came over here, he felt very differently about it. But certainly now he's as proud as anyone um, of uh, what I've been able to do at TSN. But, um, you know, honestly, when I went to school, I didn't know that I wanted to be a sports caster, right? I, I thought I wanted to be an athlete. And then, uh, and it was kind of like you because you didn't see people of our color doing it. And more so here in Vancouver, there were three television stations that did sports. And um, you knew who the people were that were doing it. They'd been there forever. You didn't think they were leaving to go anywhere. So I just didn't think there'd be any opportunity, regardless of what your ethnicity was. So it wasn't until I got to university and I knew I wanted to get to university. I thought I'd wind up in media relations or something like that. I took communications at, at Simon Fraser. And then from there, um, you know, I, uh, I worked as the sports information director at the school and I kind of networked my way through. And then it wasn't until I actually got my first radio job and I was a producer and then I kind of had to fill in. The Canucks were going to the finals in 94 and I had to fill in. And then I thought, I really like this. And um, it, it just kind of went from there. So it was never really a goal, even when I entered university, but kind of like you kind of figured it out a little bit later. Yeah, it, it's one of those things for me too. Like I wanted to be – actually, I wanted to do more of what you do, uh, what you do, in-game stuff, reporting. And for me, again, it, it was always difficult to kind of picture myself doing it only because I didn't think it was a realistic um, opportunity, uh, a realistic job out there just because we didn't see that representation. And then when I got into it, I started doing more anchoring and I was kind of, kind of been put into different positions, and you know this – when you are asked to do something in this industry, you say yes. Right? Oh, yeah. Even if you are not ready for it, uh, you say yes because you never know what opportunity may come and you don't want to be that person that says no. So it is very interesting to see how you kind of get put in the spot, uh, kind of stumble into something, and then it kind of grows from there. Yeah, for me, you know, my first job, and people talk about, you know, how did your color in impact one way or another, whether you got an opportunity? And quite frankly, it helped me because – I got the radio job in 94 and this, it lasted about nine months because the station made a format change and they didn't want any more sports. So the show that I was producing and hosting from time to time just went away. So then in 95, 
I started, I got hired um, by CBC. And when I got hired, you know, I had done a demo reel where I, you know, I, some people that I knew kind of helped me put one together. I didn't have any TV experience. And they actually hired me to anchor the weekend news at CBC in Vancouver. And I had never read a teleprompter. I had never done sports. You know, I, I, I didn't go to BCIT. I, I didn't go to Ryerson. I'd never taken a course. I just kind of was learning as I went. And you have to believe that my color and my background helped me get that job, right? And, and I went and talked to the executive producer and I said, couldn't you let me just do some stories and, and do some sports first? Because that's kind of what I want to do. And they said, no, if you want to do this, this is the job. So I was the weekend news anchor. The first time I'd read a prompter, I'd already been hired. And it was just um, an in-house uh, screen test. I was awful, like just really, really bad. And, um, you know, I thought I could get it figured out, but it, it was a lot to learn, and, you know, just in terms of how to use your voice and how to manage the camera and, and all those other things around you. And you really realize, and I know you appreciate this, how much faith you put into other people around you to make you look good. You know, for me, so, you know, I had to learn how to basically sports cast on the fly. What about you? What are some of the things that, that you learned on your way through? You know, my first job was in Prince George, BC. I was a news reporter because for me and, and talking to people like you, it was like, hey, go out, go to a small market, make your mistakes. Like those are the sacrifices you have to make in this industry. It's really difficult to, to get into like a Vancouver like you did and yeah. get on air right away. And so that's what I did. I went to Prince George. I, I was a news reporter. It wasn't even sports. I didn't care. I just wanted to get on air. And I made a ton of mistakes. I did radio on the weekends, news radio on the weekends, and I was terrible, dude. Uh, it was so bad. I can tell you how bad it was. And it was just one of those situations where you kept trying. Uh, I would work on so many li different little things. And from there, I had an opportunity to anchor on my next job. And again, I was never thinking about anchoring. When I applied for the job, I applied for a reporter, but they're like, no, there's an anchoring involved. And for people who don't know, I've never used a teleprompter. You talk about the teleprompter. It's one of the most unnatural things you will ever do is reading a teleprompter. And for the people who can do it really well, uh, it, it is a serious skill because it, it's just, again, you're seeing the words fly by and depending on the speed and you're relying on somebody else who's, who's changing the speed, um, going by what you're saying. And so um, I got put in that position. I remember when I got my big break at CBC, I was hired to do this online show, Hockey Night Canada Online, which is a brand new online show. I was doing some of the morning show and about, I got hired in April. In June, the World Cup was happening. And they came to me and they're like, hey, you have a bit of a soccer background. Can you do this post-game show for us? It's going to be online. No problem. Yeah, I'll do it. No problem. But a week later, they come up to me like, hey, we're actually going to put it on our secondary channel. It's called Bolt. I've never heard of Bolt. I worked at CBC. I had never heard of the channel Bolt. I'm like, nobody's watching. Who cares? Sure, I'll do it. I'm not even joking. About a week and a half before, a man named Chris Irwin, who's executive producer, came up to me and said, hey, we're actually going to put it on uh, the main network. You're going to be hosting this show on the main network. I'd never hosted anything in my life before. And um, it was one of those sink or swim moments. And there were some <laughs> sinking moments in that. But at the same time, I was able to do it. I got comfortable over the month. And it was a huge, it was a huge accomplishment for me. And it was a huge confidence booster to see, hey, I was put in this position. You know, you have to go out and have the confidence that you can do it. You know, anytime I think, especially in our industry, yeah. if you don't have confidence in yourself, you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to believe in you. And you're already losing right away. Um, because our mistakes are very public, obviously, right? And so I think uh, for people who want to maybe potentially pursue this industry, know that confidence is a key. You really have to believe in yourself and apply yourself. And sometimes, again, you're going to be put in uncomfortable situations, but you almost have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable always in our industry. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, and, you know, when you talk about it, I remember the first radio job I had, and I was just a producer, right? And, and the... Um, the main host was also working for TSN at the time and I wasn't. So he would go out and cover the Canucks and that year in 94, they went to the final and we used to have a, a group of people we would go to whenever he couldn't make it that would fill in host. And it was my job to find those people. Well, a lot of those people were traveling with the Canucks at the time too. And then I remember the show started at three o'clock and at about one thirty, one forty-five, it dawned on me. We couldn't find any other hosts and I had to do it. And I had to host a four hour show and just talk and, you know, I was a hockey guy, but I was also a football guy. And I thought, God, I better get into my comfort zone a little bit here. And I scheduled a few more football guests. And, you know, at the end of the first four hours, I'm not sure I was any good, but I knew I loved it. 
right? And it, it was kind of at that moment that I got hooked. And um, yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you get put in these situations where you've got to be uncomfortable. Uh, you, you know, you were able to make some mistakes in Prince George. I never got that opportunity. I always say to kids, or I used to, now it's, it's changed so much. I used to say to kids all the time, you had to go and cut your teeth in a small market before you could make it back. I never did that. And now, you know, when I, when I have the same conversations, that's not really the path anymore. It's kind of figure it out online, right? Like you can, you can webcast and there's a number of different platforms and people looking for those kinds of opportunities. You might not get paid, but you can certainly make all your mistakes and figure it out and, and get better. Uh, what, what are some of the other things for you in terms of, you know, adversity? Did you ever feel like you had to overcome a lot? Yeah. I mean, I always felt like every job that I, I got hired for and I've been blessed. I mean, I, I think the first job was the hardest one to get. I remember I yeah. graduated in, um, and I always tell everybody that the first one, and maybe it's changed now a little bit, but again, you know, traditionally when coming up, that first one was so hard to get. It took me like five months to get my first job. I, I think at that time I was sending out DVDs to people. I had applied for 26 jobs uh, wow. and I got two callbacks. I'm lucky to get one. Um, one of my classmates was a friend of mine was already working at the station. And so, um, again, I was waiting for on-air jobs only, so that's all I was applying for, and it wasn't didn't want to go behind the scenes. But that was a bit of adversity. And then every job I got after, it was kind of like, okay, you're taking the next step up. I was never ready for it. I, I think coming to ESPN was the first time that I've actually been ready for something. Still, I didn't know what I was getting into when I was coming to ESPN, but this is the most ready I've ever been for a job. When I came to TSN, Definitely, I never hosted you know Sports Center type hour long show. I was doing three minute updates at uh, at CBC and, and hosting different things. So I think that's always been my challenge: is kind of adapting to my environment. Again, you talk about the team around us. That is so critical. People behind the scenes, getting to know your producers, getting to know all the different people that are going to be able to help you. And again, that's something here at ESPN. We have so many resources that um, that's one of the things I kind of got used to and, and very fortunate to have. But, you know, challenges along the way, I, I think, you know, race, and we talked about race a little bit earlier and just being minority. I mean, that was a challenge for me. I don't know if you got it when you came to TSN, but when I came to, to, to Sports Center and I first started, I was getting racist backlash all the time wow. on Twitter. And I, that, was, that was one of the things for me. And uh, again, remember, Twitter has also evolved so much now, right? I'm talking now 2012, the end of 2012, early 2013, where we're still learning about Twitter and we were trending overnight, uh, Sports Center, because people were attacking us and then people were defending us and it was this whole thing. And it was one of those situations where I sat back and I was like, dude, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? Like, this is mentally affecting me. I don't want, I, I didn't ask for this. I'm just trying to honestly report the scores, you know, just doing this kind of dream job that we yeah. wanted to do. But it, it was one of those areas where I, I had to think back and listen, look at all the sacrifices I've made. You know, I moved to Prince George, I moved away from my family, I missed all these sorts of things, um, you know, in my friends' lives and all these big events and so forth, all these sacrifices I made to get here. I can't let these people, these trolls take it away. And as we've grown and as we've seen social media and we understand it better now, you know, we understand that you just don't take that stuff personally anymore. But I think that was one of the hardest challenges because again, if you're not confident in yourself and it was only, I think in the last five, six years where I really kind of just become comfortable with myself and I know who I am on air and stuff. Um, I think that's kind of when I really prospered and just kind of blocked out the noise. And I think that's kind of been a big thing for me. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm really fortunate that when I began in this industry, there was no social media, and yeah. I didn't have to deal with that kind of it, kind of adversity. Uh, and quite frankly, you know, I'm 52 now, and I haven't dealt with a lot of racism. I, I really feel blessed that I haven't had that a lot. You know, growing up, you know, I can think of two to three moments, and the reason you remember them is because there was only two to three moments, and, and that matters to me, right? And um, I know when I was first getting into the business, I thought, do I need to change my name? You know, just to placate the masses. My father. Uh, whose name is Phil Rose, uh, he was in real estate and everybody used to call him Phil. And I thought, do I need to change my name? And I decided early I wasn't going to. I also wanted to make sure I said my name correctly. I wasn't going to be correcting a bunch of other people. You say my name however you want, but I'm going to say my name correctly. I'm going to be proud of my name. I'm going to be proud of my heritage. And I'm lucky. I mean, I've had some comments where all of a sudden in Canada, people, if you say something about hockey and people don't understand, they're going to make a racist comment that because of your color, you don't understand hockey. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't like fighting in hockey. That's not because I'm not 
Caucasian, right? It, I just don't like fighting in hockey. I, I view it as a father, and I don't want my son to feel that that's what he's got to model because he plays hockey as well. And there's issues like that that you'll get a few comments here and there, but I, I, I learned early that it was such a vocal minority that you can't take it seriously. You know, your colleagues, your superiors, those are the people that you want to impress because they have a real pulse of a larger segment of the audience in terms of what what is important and whether or not you're doing a good job. And those are the things that matter to me the most. So, you know, you want the love from your family and, you know, your kids. If someone on Twitter is going to say something, you know, I have developed a pretty thick skin. It was kind of funny. My wife got into local politics in New Westminster. And when she first got on, people would attack her and it would be one person. And she just took it so personally. The phone was actually shaking in her hand and I had to explain to her to just lighten up, right? I mean, phones and keyboards empower people and you can't let it take, you can't, you know, make sure you don't take it personally, right? So um, it's interesting. But I mean, the job itself has so many challenges to begin with. I think the last thing either one of us wants to focus on is uh, is that type of thing, because that really can be distracting for you. Like, what does a day look like for you at ESPN? So ESPN here, uh, so if I'm doing Sports Center, um, basically a day looks like, uh, let's just say I'm doing an 11 o'clock show at, uh, at night. I'll come in around, uh, well, we have a show meeting around 4.30. So right now that's over Zoom or whatever before we come in for that. Um, and then we, we get in around 6, start prepping. I would say one of the big differences between ESPN and TSN is that there's a lot more writing here for our show for Sports Center for ESPN. Um, and so you're just getting into the writing, uh, the researching. We're lucky. We have, no, you can't watch every single game, right? You've got like two games going, two, three games going on at a time to try to pay attention to. But, you know, you talk, to, just going back to the challenges for a second, I think one of the things people don't realize uh, when we're on air, and you know this very well from doing, you know, the drafts and everything you've done, is that, like, we have somebody talking in our ear. you got a producer in your ear. You know, you got somebody counting in your ear. There's just so many different things that are happening. So when you are sitting on set, I want to be as prepared as possible. I want to know as much as possible. Um, I'll give you an example. I was doing a morning show uh, in my first year here at ESPN. I think it was like four or five months in, three, four months in maybe. And that show was a three hour show. So it's a long show. Um, you know, you come in, I came in about five in the morning or something to prep for that one and go on air. And my producer's telling me, we just, we just went on air. Uh, Jay Harris is my co-host. He's doing the first story, whatever the first, first story was. My producer tells me Antonio Brown has requested a trade. Uh, that was when he went on Instagram and said he wanted to leave the Raiders. And so the whole show blows up. Three hours is gone. All that work you did, all that. So now in that moment, you're hoping that you have consumed enough and you know enough about Antonio Brown, his situation, that we're going to go on the fly. And we went four hours in a row. Uh, just wow. on the fly, get Adam Schefter, get this guy, get that guy, get Lewis, Ray, whoever it was. We try to get to every different angle. And it's not like at that point you're getting force-fed questions. You, you've got to kind of know uh, what you're talking about and try to get as much information as we can. So that was a great learning moment for me um, at ESPN. I, I've never done anything like that to that extent uh, as far as breaking news for four hours. Um, but I think it's just, again, part of the challenges of the job sometimes. That happens once in a while, but part of the challenges and part of the day-to-day, -day, just to expect the unexpected because everything would blow up in a second, especially here, they're willing to go. We got to go and we got to go in all, all in. Yeah, I've had a few of those as well. I mean, hosting the CFL draft and the first pick gets traded right before the draft starts and your whole first, you know, two blocks, you basically tear the, the sheet up and you just kind of go on the fly. Um, you know, one of those moments for me was uh, at the Olympics in 2010 in Vancouver. Uh, you'll remember the, the Georgian loser. Uh, I'll remember his name like it was yesterday, Nodar Kumar Ichvili. And I was, I'd finished all my prep for uh for all the sliding events because that's what I was doing up in Whistler for, for all the games. That was my assignment. And I just went up to the venue to talk to people and just kind of, you know, fine tune a few things. And I, I was not prepared. I was not dressed. I was not shaved. I was not anything. And I was literally 50 feet away when he hit the pole and it, it all happened. And um, within minutes, every affiliate around the country was calling and I had to go live and put the story into context and make everybody understand. And, um, you know, the, the Olympic opening ceremony show, just the, the script changed where Brian Williams came on. He basically went to me and Whistler and we had to break this whole thing down and, you know, everything changed so fast. Um, but I got to be honest, 
certainly respect to the person that, that passed away. But for me, when those things happen, I love it. Like, not that someone's passed away, please don't misunderstand, but just the adrenaline and the intensity of that live moment. And, and you're right, it really does separate who's prepared and who's not because you're exposed. You know, you're basically naked and you've got to make sure that you, um, everyone's looking to criticize you in that moment. They are. You, it's the moment where you're the most exposed and um, I, I enjoy it. I, I just like that adrenaline rush and, and I think that's when the job's at its most exciting. Yeah, and you got to be transparent in those moments, right? When, when you yeah. don't know the information, you just got to say it. We, we hate saying we don't know this information, but in those moments, you cannot be wrong. I want to ask you about that because that is such a delicate moment, right? I mean, I was asking a couple of my co-anchors when Kobe Bryant died because I know if I was on air at that time, Kobe Bryant, I, I grew up watching. He, he's a big part of my life as far as my sports life. And I know the feeling I got when I found out the news. Um, so I can't even imagine what it would be like when I was on air because it would be emotional for me. And sometimes I have, dif I have difficulty in those moments when we're doing obits and stuff like that. It just gets to me sometimes. What, what's that moment like for you? How do you focus yourself? I know you can't really prepare yourself, but how do you get into that moment? How do you deliver that kind of news? Yeah, it's different. I mean, I, I think that when you do sports, generally you're excited and you're happy and you're positive and you try to deliver with energy. And when you get into that moment, you completely have to take a step back from how you normally work. Uh, you've got to slow it down. You have to be measured. You have to be respectful. Uh, don't smile. Uh, you know, your pacing changes. Like all of, all of it uh, is, is very different, right? And um, it's hard to prepare for that. And in terms of this case, a lot of information was coming to me at the same time because I also didn't know him very well because he was a, an athlete that um, – was not expected to do well, right? If there was a, you know, he was able to make it based on his country's Olympic standard, but in terms of the overall sport, it was not somebody that you focused on as somebody that could be a potential medalist. So you had to find a different way to humanize him. And um, I guess I'm fortunate I didn't know him personally. I mean, with Kobe, uh, I, I had a chance to get to know him a little bit and certainly cover him a lot. And I was a big fan like you. I, that would have been difficult to stay measured. I know I was on a flight uh, connecting in Chicago when it happened and I was devastated when the plane landed and I checked my phone and saw the social feeds and I just couldn't believe it. Right. So, uh, been a different year. There's no doubt. Um, and as we transition to the year 2020, just how's it affected your day-to-day -day life? You know, what's, what's wild is we were, um, launching this show on an app called Quibi, which <laughs> no longer exists, but, um, Quibi was this big time app that was coming out as a new streaming service, a new way to watch things. And we were launching a show on ESPN and I was hosting that show and we launched right during the pandemic. We launched in April and um, it was a really difficult time to, to launch. So I was actually working the night the NBA went down. I was doing that show, um, which was March 11th, I believe. And from there, sports centers kind of hit hiatus. We only had one show and I think there was nothing going on. Right. But we kept doing these Quibi shows and just kind of prepping for them and then we launched in april and so for me my sports center duties kind of went down um but i was doing this show and we were launching which was such a it was an odd unique time to be doing things to be launching a show and so i kept going into work um i did a, we had a home studio in case we needed it but you know it was essential staff only so i, I still was going in so my day-to-day -day didn't change all that much um but it was i mean to, to, to scrape content out at that time was difficult. And then you talk about some of the emotional uh, pulls uh, as, a, as a sports anchor and trying to separate yourself from some of these things. It was difficult at the time. So um, I think it's just been one of those years now that we've kind of gotten back to sports and we kind of hit sports uh, in the summer. That was great for me because again, sports center kind of came back on regular and, and kind of got back into it. But uh, it, it has been, I guess in one sense, it was, I was fortunate that I was going into the office, so I had some normalcy in my life. Um, but at the same time, as far as career wise, like I was preparing to do three different shows at that time Sports Center uh, in the Crease, which is our NHL show on ESPN, Plus, and this Quibi show. And from there, everything kind of crashed. And I, I definitely was not prepared for that. But what about you? How did that affect you? Yeah, it's been different. I mean, I, I worked just as much as I have before. Um, I made a real effort early in the process to pitch as much content as I possibly could. And I learned that there was a, a sensitive way to do that because I had people that were 
you know, dealing with it in Ontario and our numbers, even though we had a complete lockdown here in, in Vancouver, uh, our numbers weren't necessarily as bad. Um, you know, there were some people that were quite frightened. I wasn't necessarily frightened. And so you want to work and you want to pitch this, but there's people that are emotionally in a different place, right? So uh, that was a bit of a, a balancing act, but eventually we, we got back to a bit of normalcy and, and I just made a real effort early on. I was going to continue to push content because we all want to keep our jobs, right? I mean, we all have mortgages. We all have kids that we're trying to make sure that we can look after and provide for. And I just wanted to make sure that I can keep working as much as possible. There was a lot of CFL news in terms of how it was going to affect the startup of the season. Uh, then uh, eventually the, you know, the Canucks got back um, into training camp and, and went out into the bubble. I went to Edmonton and covered the bubble. Um, I've, I've got my cameraman, uh, Owen Corbell, who's actually here now, he, he comes over like three, four days a week. He's now become a part of the family. And oh, we, we do, I, I know, right? Easy guy to love. And and we have got a lot of our content that we just produce out of, out of my living room, right? Um, I hosted the CFL draft from my living room. And um, so, yeah, so I mean, I, and I, I've been able to do more now because they've now given me a bit of an analyst role on the NFL, which I, I haven't had before because I didn't play in the NFL. And now there's a bit of room for getting a bit of extra coverage. So I'm doing that. I'm doing some NCAA, which I didn't do before. So when you factor all of that in, I haven't been traveling, which has been different for me. I usually do a lot of travel, uh, but I'm still really, really busy. So I'm thankful for that sugar. How, how do you see the industry moving forward? Because again, I think all networks have done an incredible job when you look at the programming that's gone on over the last basically year uh, from home, right? Um, and, and now networks are seeing that, hey, we can kind of do these sorts of things. We can cut out a lot of the fat, if you want to call it that, uh, the travel and so forth and whatever. How do you see it moving forward? Because I think that's an important thing for people who may be thinking about this industry uh, to kind of consider moving forward on, on how our broadcasting future will look. Yeah, I worry about it, to be frank. I mean, I think the industry as a whole has changed a lot because of how people are able to consume media, traditional forms, whether it's newspapers or cable television, things have changed. And I think you need to evolve with it. I, I, you know, I, I hope I can. You know, I, I find that at TSN, we're not hiring sportscasters anymore. We're hiring content providers. You know, we just hired another Smiley Selimvalji in Calgary and he's got a writing background, right? So part of the exercise now when you get hired is you, you get asked to do a something on air, but you, can you write a story behind it? And can you uh, put together a social media presentation and pr plan around the story? Is there something that you could kind of put at the top there that you just, it may not have been the best event, but something that you think about when you look back at your career and be like, man, that was, that was incredible. Yeah. You know, I, I think probably the Olympics, I just think there's a, an energy and a vibe when so many of the best athletes in the world get together and, and so many young people, um, you know, I've done five of them. My uh, first was in Athens. And, you know, just an incredible place to be during an Olympics. And, you know, you kind of get the best of the city, right? They sanitize it and hide all the problems and put a big Band-Aid on it. And then you just get to celebrate and party, right? So um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, doing it in my own hometown in Vancouver was brilliant. You know, I, I was up in Whistler for most of it. Uh, my son was about a year and a half at the time, and my wife would bring him up. And, and uh, we would take him to some of the venues and things like that, and, and he'd get to see. And, and I still have my Olympic torch from running in the relay which I have mounted in his bedroom, right? Um, going to Athens, or sorry, going to London, and I was locked into track and field uh, for that. I was on the programming side for that, which is really the biggest event in the Summer Olympics, right, is track and field. And to spend some time with Usain Bolt, and, you know, I actually got to know Oscar Pistorius well. So to see the, the documentary was just, it was mind-numbing because he was such a, it would see, appeared to be at the time a, a gentle, humble human being, right? And to see that, uh, uh, so I think probably the Olympics, especially those, were really, really exciting to be a part of. Let me let me jump back for a second here, because again, like people will ask me all the time, "Hey, who's the coolest guy you've met?" And that's like common question we always get, right? Who's the coolest? I wasn't in the field very, very much. I, I kind of quickly transitioned into um, studio. You have li you just you just name drop uh, Usain Bolt. Like who yeah. is, I would say the, the top two or three most interesting high profile athletes that you have come across that you've got to interview, maybe if you have a, a personal tale, any of those kind of guys. Yeah. You know, I'm bad at answering that question. I totally am because it, it all just blurs because there's been so many, but you know, I remember one of the moments during the Olympics was Kobe Bryant. Um, 
he was he was in the stadium kind of near where our press tribune area was for all the rights holders right so usually what would happen is there was a number of you know essentially squared off section spaces and then the athletes would get brought from place to place to place like they'd just kind of make their way through and we were about 10th or 12th out of 70 right um you know they had the main nbc bbc sky sports and then eventually they you know they came to us it kind of depended on the size of your country and how big your broadcast dollar deal was worth right and the person the host didn't know who Kobe Bryant was and they were kind of giving him some attitude. So I turned around and noticed and I said, Oh, he's with me. Uh, what about you? Like, how do you prep? Uh, you know, do you have any stretching exercises in the back? Do you warm up your vocal cords? How do you, how do you prep to, to do one of your shows? I probably should. It might be a little <laughs> bit better if I, do if I did. Uh, no, I, I think for me, it's a lot of reading. I'm always trying to read and try to, um, you know, stay on top of what's going on. For me, the biggest uh, transition coming from Canada to the United States was college sports. Like, you know this, like you cover college sports. You are a, you are a guy, you and Jesse Palmer in Canada. And um, we don't do a ton of it. And the stuff we do do, a lot of the stuff, like the stuff Jesse would do on, um, weekly that goes online. And like we just, until it comes to the bowl games, right? Am I, am I wrong in saying until we get to the bowl games, that's when we kind of really ramp it up and we do a good job. But throughout the year, we don't really cover it as much. We have the, the highlights and stuff. And I just didn't grow up in that. And so yeah. for me, that was an adjustment because college sports are everything here, right? And so I have really um, made, a, made an effort because my knowledge for most sports is, is pretty decent. But for me, it's been college football and college basketball, which I actually know quite a bit about, but more college football, um, and just really immersing myself into it. And I've talked to different people, different resources, like, hey, what should I be looking for? And um, I think the first year was one of those ones you kind of go through and you kind of learn about some of the tr traditions that I didn't know about. And then this year, I'm really, really enjoying it because now I, I know so much more. I'm listening to all the podcasts I'm listening to right now, are basically college football podcasts. Yeah. And um, for me, I, some of those sports, I kind of wish, yeah, I wish I had kind of got into it earlier because I love it so much now. Um, but that's one of those things where I think, I think when you're out weaker is not the right word, but you know, where I think you need to kind of brush up on your knowledge. That's where I kind of put my emphasis in. And that for me has been college football here. Yeah. For me, I've been obsessed with college football since I was a little kid. You know, people ask me why, and I actually tell them it's because I'm a smiley and we didn't have Christmas growing up because not having Christmas growing up, there was college football on television. And that was the only thing I could watch the NBA on Christmas day when I was, you know, a preteen wasn't a thing. But college football, there was like a couple of all-star games that were on. And that's what I did because we didn't have Christmas. So it became my passion. Like people ask me if I like the NFL or the CFL. I like NCAA Division I college football. That is, I love all of them, but NCAA is my thing. Um, so when I watch you do college football live, like I am jealous because that is my dream gig. And I've seen you do it. You do a fantastic job. I never know that you didn't do it before or that you didn't have a passion for it before because you come off so well. So uh, I'm proud of you because I think you do a great job. And last thing, because I know we got to wrap this up. Um, what advice would you give to people that want to get into the industry? We talked about how we both broke in and how different it is now, but what's the key? Yeah, you know, I think it's, like, like you said off the top, it's so different, right? The, the advice I give to people now is so different than what it was five years ago. Yeah, you know, the networking thing is what I was going to emphasize as well. I think it really does come down to who you know. Uh, and just those relationships you're willing to cultivate because if you don't have the confidence to network and develop those relationships you probably don't have the confidence to do what we're doing so that really matters and I think you mentioned it earlier try to learn as many areas of the industry as you can even behind the scenes because you, you just want to be invaluable you want to create that situation where someone can bring you in and maybe even create something around your skill set the wider that is the better opportunity you're going to have hey listen this has been a lot of fun for me I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I got to get to some NFL stuff. I know you're preparing for Sports Center, but uh, real quick, uh, give us your social platforms if people want to get a hold of you. Yeah, so on uh, Twitter, it's uh, the Bill Kareem ESPN, and on Instagram, it's uh, the Bill Kareem. And for me, Farhan Alji TSN, both on Instagram and on Twitter. I'm not on any of the other things. My, you can find my son on all that stuff. I just do the two. But uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us. We really enjoyed doing this. Thanks, Farhan. Appreciate it, man.